As I said in the last video, by 1959, rock was up against some very significant ch challenges. This early period of rock and roll that started with Little Richard and Chuck Berry and uh, Bill Haley and the Comets and Fats Domino, went through Elvis Presley and then the artists that we've been talking about uh, just most recently, Buddy Holly and, and people like that. Uh, there's some real problems that start to hit at the end of the decade. Maybe the most obvious one being, uh, as we said when we were talking about Elvis, in 1958, Elvis goes into the army. Now, Colonel Tom Parker was smart about having a bunch of platoons recorded up so that he could continue to release Elvis, new Elvis stuff while Elvis was unable to record, to try to sustain his career so that his career didn't die when he was unavailable for a couple of years. But nevertheless, um, uh, he went into the army and so he was off the scene uh, to a certain extent. It turns out, uh, some stories go, that Elvis could have actually gotten, not a, he did get a deferment, but he could have uh, b b gone with the USO and been a performer. Uh, but no, I mean, uh, what he really wanted to do was serve. I think the colonel thought that it, since Elvis had been so controversial earlier, uh, it was good to show that he was an honest, upstanding young American boy who was happy to fight for his country. And the whole idea the colonel had was about mainstream streaming um, Elvis Presley so that when rock and roll died, Elvis's career wouldn't die. I mean, people at RCA were behind, were, were behind that idea, too. So uh, that's sort of the way. But neither, either way, m by 58, uh, Elvis was out of the picture. We talked in the last video about how Buddy Holly died in a plane crash in February of 1959. Little Richard quit rock and roll to preach in late 1957, figuring that rock and roll was the devil's music. This goes to this idea of a, of a conflict uh, between you know gospel and the church as being the, the work of God and rock and roll being sort of the devil drawing people into you know dark clubs at night, this kind of thing. And so Little Richard, as the story goes, was on a flight and uh, it was a very, very bumpy flight and he was afraid he was gonna die and he made a prayer uh, saying, uh, you made a promise to God saying, uh, if you get me down from this plane alive, I will quit rock and roll and I will serve you. And the flight landed safely and he kept his word and quit. And anyway, he was out by late 1957. Uh, Chuck, Chuck Berry in late 1959 was arrested for violating what's called the Mann Act, which is transporting a minor across state lines. He always maintained these were trumped up charges that were basically a way of trying to strike back at a successful black uh, American in this country. He appealed the, uh, uh, a conviction um, and ended up having to do some uh, prison time for that. But anyway, uh, he, was, he was out for a while uh, by late 1959. There was the Jerry Lee Lewis scandal in May of 1958. Um, his third wife, Myra, was actually his cousin once removed. It turns out that she was 13 at the time they were married, and his second marriage had not quite been final at the time. Uh, this was such a scandal that it basically forced Jerry Lee Lewis out of, uh, out of uh, the mainstream uh, pop world, at least for a couple of years. He, he went on to have a very successful career in country and western music in the 60s, and uh, I think his, all is forgiven now. But back at the time, it just, that kind of thing really fit in too much with the negative stereotypes that had to do with southern, uh, southern life. And so by that time, we're talking about Elvis, Buddy Holly, Little Richard, Chuck Berry, Jerry Lee Lewis, all being out of the scene uh, by sometime in 1959. So rock and roll was in trouble in terms of its performers. And then come the payola investigations in late 1959. And I think it's important for us to understand that rock and roll, with all this crossover, these independent labels and these unwieldy, unmanageable musicians, had cut, a significant, had cut out a significant amount of market share for themselves, of, of, of market share that used to belong to the major labels. Um, and all of these Tin Pan Alley composers who just not too long ago, publishers had been selling all kinds of music, were now having a problem having to deal with this rock and roll thing. They thought, they, they kept thinking that music would just go back to the way it was in 1945 and when people got over this rock and roll fever and came to their senses. Uh, somebody like Mitch Miller, for example, at, at Columbia, uh, was proud not to have any rock and roll artists on their label. He was staying true to what was real music. Most of these guys in the music business, the older guys who ran the record companies, had no respect for rock and roll. They thought that rock and roll musicians were kind of cretins and the fans were stupid and gullible. And uh, they couldn't believe how it had gotten so popular. And mostly they just wanted their market share back, it seems. But to a certain extent, 
they thought that perhaps it was because these indie labels were cheating. Um, and they were able to convince people in Washington that that was in fact the case. Now, as it turned out, a congressional committee in Washington was just finishing up an investigation of quiz shows. Maybe you know that relatively recent movie about that where there was a quiz show that it turned out was rigged. And so the idea that hits on the radio would be rigged and that's how this lousy rock and roll music could overtake what we all know is good traditional Tin Pan Alley music. That must be what's going on. So this congressional committee decided to turn its attention after having finished up with the quiz show to what was going on in the music business and especially on radio and to a certain extent uh, television. So the House Special Subcommittee on Legislative Oversight uh, got to work and started interviewing people about this. Now their whole contention was that um, that there was this pay for play thing going on, that people were, the record labels, especially indies, were paying disc jockeys to play these records. That's why they were getting on the air, that's why they were becoming hits. And it, 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 these investigations adversely affected both the major labels and the indie labels because they were all doing it. It's just that the major labels were able to endure this and it drove a lot of the indie labels out of business, just having to defend yourself uh, legally and, and all that goes with it. Um, Anyway, payola, this idea of paying for play, has a long history in popular music. There was nothing really new about what was going on. Um, the major labels spent probably a lot more money than the indie labels did paying to get plays on the radio. But um, anyway, the con Congress got in there and they started asking questions and it became a big scandal. There were two people who were sort of, uh, who, who, who were the, the um, biggest stars to be questioned in all this. The first was Dick Clark who was just getting started in his American bandstand career uh, out of Philadelphia, the television show he'd been involved in radio. But it turns out Dick Clark, thinking he was being a smart businessman, had invested in a kind of portfolio of products. Uh, he, was, he owned publishing, he owned shares in record manufacturing, he owned shares in the show that he was, uh, he was uh, uh, producing. And so you can get the idea that there could be a conflict of interest that could arise when you own a part of the record company and the publishing on a record that you're playing on your television show that's nationally syndicated, right? That could be a kind of a conflict of interest. The way he portrayed himself in Congress, however, was, fellas, I'm, I'm just trying to make a living here. Whatever you tell me you think I should do in order to keep this as clean as possible, that's what I want to do. But I'm just a businessman trying to make my, my fortune in the music business. I'm trying to play by the rules. So if there's something here that's wrong, you know, I'm, I'm happy to do whatever I can to accommodate. And so they ended up thinking that Dick Clark was just a fantastic young man, a model sort of citizen, a great businessman, that kind of thing. He came out of the whole thing almost entirely unscathed with his reputation intact, even though there were some very uh, edgy moments for him and some possibility of his career collapsing. He came through it with flying colors and was praised. Alan Freed, on the other hand, did not. Uh, he continually resisted and was 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 not particularly cooperative. Um, he eventually um, pleaded guilty to taking uh, bribes. Um, he was. Um, he got a suspended sentence and a $300 fine, but he, by that time he'd already been fired from every job uh, that he'd had when he was at the height of his career. So no more radio, no more TV, no more nothing. Uh, and by 1965, he was sort of um, died um, um, a kind of a broken man. And so it's too bad about how all of that turned out for Alan Freed and Dick Clark was able to get through it all. Um, one of the effects, or there, I guess there were many effects to the payola investigations. One of them is that it made radio stations much more conservative in the, in the sense that they were fearful of losing their licenses. I mean, a radio station can only broadcast if it has a license by the federal government. So if the federal government decides to pull your license, you're out of business. So you'd really better be sure you're, you know, minding your, uh, minding your business closely and, and, and not uh, transgressing against anything that could get you into, into trouble. And so after all the rock and roll craziness that had gone on with DJs and all this kind of thing, these music business pros decide that, you know, they uh, had better take a little bit more control over what music gets on the radio so they don't get into trouble this way. And in fact, one of the things we can say about this next era is if the 
period from 1955 through 59 have been dominated by independent labels and artists who, you know, uh, defied uh, tradition and maybe poli regular polite behavior and that kind of thing, if it was kind of the wild west of the music business. After that, after all this payola thing and the various musicians were out of it, the next era was the music business taking control of rock and roll again. That is, they liked the idea that there was this youth, youth market that had been created uh, that they could sell records to, but they figured they could probably do it better and more efficiently if they took it over, and so that's essentially what happened. So what we're going to try to figure out next week is um, when this happens, are these years from 1960 through the end of 1963, the Beatles hit this country in early 1964, that period between um, Elvis and the Beatles, uh, is this period a kind of a dark ages for rock music when rock becomes sort of homogenized and family friendly and lacking all the kind of excitement and interest and edginess that it had in those first years? Or are these golden years as new styles begin to develop and new kinds of things start to happen in popular music um, that really were cut short perhaps by the arrival of the British invasion and the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and the rest of them? We'll consider all that next week.